Today, I want to talk about connections. I mean, connections in a probably a non-obvious way to you. I hope that I can make these for you. I want to talk about earth processes, what I study, um, and earth processes that happen over millennia down to microseconds, but how I communicate those to people and how that then transfers to making this world a better place as well. So I have as my friend here a Maasai warrior who's listening, and I have my cell phone, a juxtaposition of different uh, technologies and different lifestyles one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I try to improve our understanding of Earth processes and focus on natural hazards, understanding uh, the warning signs and ways that we can detect and warn, mitigate hazards across the world. And unfortunately, many of the most um, dangerous areas are in developing, uh, the developing world. Um, and very, very few of these areas are instrumented in a way as we in the, in the US are so accustomed to in, say, California. But we have thousands of seismometers and strain meters and other tools to detect some subtle changes. Japan has every five kilometers a seismometer monitoring uh, Earth motion. Um, so I've been working in East Africa and South America. And what you see on this diagram here is a, a process that I came upon immediately after the fact that for three days there were a whole series of over 102 damaging earthquakes in a very remote region, many of which caused scarps that are as, as high as three meters and a volcanic eruption. This is a huge hole that was blasted in the ground. Um, moments before this started, this eruption started, it went on for about uh, 12 hours, blasted a 600 meter wide wide and about three kilometer long hole and had cracks then along 60 kilometers in the Afar Depression. You have a few people here, you know, to give you a, a sense of scale. But some of these were scientists who were actually on the ground trying to make some observations and took off in a helicopter before the first explosion occurred that ripped this part open. What we don't want to do is ever have this happen in a populated place. So what I do obviously has to be communicated to local people and to planners and to other decision makers who are going to invest resources and have an educational program. So my mouse eye is here. I just came back from Tanzania. These are some of the great people that I met. I installed a seismometer in their Boma, just outside here. This is the women and children. There was one person who had been to school beyond the great age of a few years. There was one who spoke Kiswahili, the language there, so we were able to communicate through him. But how do I explain an earthquake? How do I explain an eruption? How do I explain uh, any of what I do with my, well, I can show you with a cell phone what we can do, um, or what I can do with a seismometer. I need to do that, though, if I want to be successful. So I'll try and give you some insights into how we, we work slowly, carefully, and how we've already made some changes in some of the developed um, some countries in East Africa. Okay, here is one way to communicate a hazard about a volcano. This is Old Oniran Guy in Tanzania. It erupted in 2008. I got to see some of it. This wasn't one of the most spectacular days. This was a, a slow stage. And you can see the steam coming up, and there's small particulate material. There's um, something called the pili that's being ejected from the volcano at a relatively <coughs> slow rate. But here, you, oh, sorry, I've done what I didn't want to do. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, I was just going to point out to you here, along the slopes, is some of the material that's come down from the clouds, been deposited, and it's unstable. And it could be discharged or come rolling down in a hot plume or cloud and inundate some of the local villages adjacent to them. But if you haven't actually seen it or it's in, not in your old traditions, it's very difficult to try and communicate. This is a way that I communicate with my students in class about the hazards of a volcano. I'll give you a quick synopsis, um, but I think you'll see the point that this isn't necessarily a good way to tackle a communication with Maasai Herbson. Um, we have small trickles of, of melt, molten rock, um, beneath the plates that will come up and accumulate. It'll trickle up through little cracks and pores and accumulate at some boundaries. Um, sometimes it accumulates at the base of the crust. It's about 30 kilometers down beneath us. Uh, it may then haunt in a shallow chamber beneath a volcano. And so a volcano has a chamber, and a volcano may persist for two million years or more and have multiple eruptions. 
Um, within this chamber, pressure's increased. It's kind of like a soda bottle. You have a cap and a soda bottle, and they're gases uh, dissolved inside the liquid. Um, when you remove the pressure by taking the cap off, the, the uh, gases come out of the solution and cause an explosion. And in much the same way, that's the same thing that happens when you depressurize and move things upward. And they fill the gases, fill up the pore spaces in the rock, and increase pressure, and we have little earthquakes that happen. As they start to increase, we warn people about the hazards. I can't communicate this in the field and to folks who don't have an education, so I have to find better ways to talk about it. Pictures are a great way to do so. This is what I use when I go out to the field. Now, I have much, um, we have some much smaller seismographs. Some of the students here at the school have actually seen my Wally and Eva. They're about this big. Um, and they're really, um, but the, oops. Um, here you have, uh, this is a, a prototype recording unit with a tel telemetry system as well, so that we can get real time information and watch to see what's happening uh, at any moment in time. Uh, and this is the seismograph, and it's nice uh, three component. Uh, uh, measuring Earth vibrations, you can even pick up your own voice um, if you do it loudly enough, as some of the students have been experimenting as we've been before my talk today. Um, you can put this on your iPhone, your iPad, and you yourself can have your own little seismograph, and you can become a junior seismologist um, and contribute to the community. Um, here's your iPhone. If you set it up, or uh, smartphone, Set up in this way, you might flat on the table, your Z components then up and down, you have two other components, and you can watch the traces and the wiggles as they move, as you talk, as you laugh, um, and as you jiggle the table, you can try shear waves and vertical waves, and work through a whole range of uh, activities. This is a great way to demonstrate, I, and not that I use my iPhone all the time in the field, but I we take the mass on. I had one example of a group of mass I, we asked them to jump to check to be sure the instruments were working, and they decided that they would illustrate their traditional tribal dances by jumping high with their spears and showing us how to make the seismometer really work well. So communicating is an adaptation stage. It's an important way to, to, to work. And, and I've got this slide up. I'll talk for a second. Um, but I, mean, I have a, a little uh, story to tell you, a little vignette. I've got one of my experiences on the volcano in northern Tanzania in 2007. I, a tourism company took tourists up who wanted to go up to see the volcano, not realizing the risks of the hazards. There was no information or no way for them to know. And you know, as we are, you go to another part of the world and you kind of think that somebody will warn me if this is dangerous. One of the porters actually fell into a fissure and was severely burned. That guy's now in the village. Um, you know, we, we as scientists engaged in the community realized that our, uh, their trust of us was going to be dependent on his medical care and what happened. Um, uh, we uh, arranged for some training, you know, now he's a shop, he's married. When I was just out there um, to visit, he had a goat for me. Um, so, you know, this trust, this arrangement, this way of communicating is critically important. I can be as smart as I want with my little cell phone. I can write as clever algorithms to do, um, to do my science, but if I don't communicate it well and, effect, and lead to effective policy, I won't have achieved very much in my lifetime at all. So here are a couple of examples. One of the things that I've been trying to do, I, I do as often as I possibly can, is engage undergraduate students who, who don't have a lot of preconceived ideas. They're not deeply engaged in the science, but they've come out to absorb and learn as much as they can. Um, this past trip, I had a, a, a Eli Witkin, who's captain of the University of Rochester Ultimate Frisbee team. Eli engaged with the kids at every one of the schools we visited. We had to use some buckets. We cut off the bottom of the bus with buckets, and it was a beautiful frisbee. We taught the kids frisbee. We played with them as we were digging the holes. We engaged the local community. And then we sat down and talked shop for a few minutes as well and explained what and why we were trying to do what we were going to do. Eli thought of that. We also engaged drivers and other folks who were in, in the community. These are some Maasai kids just watching every step of what we do. This is another experiment in Rwanda where we're installing some seismometers. Here's another one of the undergraduates I took out who, again, had great ideas. Let's have the kids come over and do stomp tests. Um, and we had everyone in the community engaged and involved in what we were doing, and we slowly and carefully are starting to build that progress. Every six months, I go visit a school. I tell them more. 
we engage more. And we just are, are uh, communicating our science and connecting at all points of time. So thank you very much.